Branch stacking, there's white anting, there's piss taking of political opponents. Unlike the Wiggles, Liberal power brokers aren't being forced to reflect the diversity of our community. We left all the interpreters there to die. Now we're getting some half-assed attempts to at grant a few of them visas. How does one become a political power broker? You've heard the expression, decisions are made by those who show up. Well, Matthias Coleman, Nick Gorin and Peter Collier, they showed up. They're the Liberal Party heavyweights who call themselves the Klan. They created this WhatsApp group to brag about how they were treating Parliament, voters and pretty much democracy itself with utter contempt. Now, there are dozens of these WhatsApp groups in Canberra and Perth. It's how like-minded politicians communicate and how they scheme and, and whatnot. The difference is this one became public. 700 pages of private messages. Some of it would blow people's minds. Oh. There's branch stacking, there's white anting, there's piss taking of political opponents, uh, and there's a fair amount of backslapping about how good they were at being complete contemptuous heads. And all led by our former finance minister. Everyone knows Matthias Cormann. He's the guy who knifed Malcolm Turnbull and left us with Scotty from marketing before pissing off to Paris as the head of the OECD. Thanks for that. We know less about Goyeran and Collier, though. For political masterminds, these guys are actually pretty average. Goyeran was a mid-level lawyer. Collier was, I think, a high school teacher and a tennis coach before they came into Parliament. They weren't particularly brilliant in either of their fields before they entered politics. They were just 1% better than the next person, who wasn't much chopped themselves. I've observed politicians professionally, unfortunately, for half my life. Some do it because they love public service. Some do it because they love the power. Most of them do it because they love the power. It's less about the legislation and more about the thrill of the backroom dealings. These are the people who can recite five seasons of the West Wing and they're excited by living a kind of piss poor version of House of Cards day to day. That's Goyeran and Collier. How do they get the power? They recruit members. They identify the next generation of talent and they approach them. They help them get elected. They, they help run their campaign. Importantly, they help raise money for them. And money is basically the most important currency in politics. The newbie member of parliament, regardless of how independent they might be, is slightly beholden to these people. We often don't know they're puppets because nobody advertises the fact they are a wholly owned subsidiary of the clan. But this is just politics. They both do it. Oh, Labor doesn't even try to hide it. They call it the faction system. But all it is is institutionalised power broking. And it's not always a bad thing. Ben Wyatt was the best politician of the past 10 years. Most people agree. You know who recruited him? Who? These guys. Brian Burke and Julian Grill, the most maligned duo in contemporary Australian politics. If people like Goyron, Burke, and for those that can remember, Noel Crichton Brown, weren't suggesting to people they stand in a seat, who would show up? We're so lazy, we need these people. The problem is power brokers often have a very narrow interest. Goyron, for example, is a fundamentalist Christian. He isn't recruiting trans pro-lifers. This guy filibustered to stop euthanasia laws getting through the parliament. They're laws that 80% of West Australians wanted. So they don't care what voters want? They care just enough to get elected. Unlike the Wiggles, Liberal power brokers aren't being forced to reflect the diversity of our community. So while Emma and Anthony are out there recruiting ethnic minorities and women who wear pants so they can better reflect society, Goyron keeps on recruiting God-bothering weirdos who reckon we should all die in agony because that's how their God wants it to be. It's bad, but what's worse is branch stacking, something the clan did for fun, according to those WhatsApp messages. How do they stack it? This is where, as well as identifying prospective members of parliament, you encourage people to join the lay party. These are the grassroots members who throw how to vote cards at you when you try to buy your democracy sausage every three or four years. In extreme cases, you pay people to join the lay party, which is illegal, but it does happen. You've got to have the numbers there because it's the lay party that endorses a particular candidate. Who's worse, Libs or Labor? Labor stacks branches just as much as the Libs. The reason I know that 
is because Mark McGowan told us so. In 2008, he accused fellow ALP member John Durazio of being, hang on, the worst ethnic branch stacker in the history of the Labor Party in Western Australia. McGowan, who was the education minister at the time in the Carpenter government, was doing a little power broking himself. Sneakers had quietly recruited Channel 7 reporter Reese Whitby to run against Orazio in the seat of Morley. They both lost. So branch stacking on both sides, but how do we fix it? You can't. The ancient Greeks were doing this. For, for branch stacking to be outlawed, you would need it to become Liberal or Labor Party policy. And for that to happen, you would have to have the people who let themselves be stacked into branches vote against the practice that put them there. And then you would need the MPs, who are themselves beholden to the power brokers who stack the branches, to vote against their political overlords. Democracy. It's still the worst type of government. Except all the others. Well, that's true. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in Afghanistan for quids. Just when you think Australia could not have stuffed Afghanistan up anymore, we find out the government has sent a bloke accused of war crimes to help the evacuation of Kabul. Morrison fought tooth and nail to stop this story coming out because he knew it would remind all of us about the Brereton report. You remember that thing? In 2016, Sydney Judge Paul Brereton's called in to get to the bottom of rumours the SAS has gone rogue, totally off the leash, Heart of Darkness style. Four years later, he delivers a report that says a couple of dozen Australian soldiers executed 39 innocent civilians. Conspicuously, he absolves the military leadership of any responsibility. The government appoints a special prosecutor to try to lay charges, as they had to do. Well, how can they even investigate now? Well, they can't. The Taliban's running the joint. This is like any other criminal investigation, but instead of cops from, say, the major crime squad, it's done by detectives from the Australian Federal Police. So are those guys really going to parachute into a militia-controlled village now to work out what was going on? To get a murder conviction, you need evidence. You need witnesses, forensics. Ideally, you need a body. You need to match a bullet to a weapon. How many spent shells are there lying around a Ruzgan province, do you reckon? And even if you did get cops on the ground, how are you going to interview people? We left all the interpreters there to die. Now we're getting some half-assed attempt to grant a few of them visas. Are you saying we should drop it? No, we can't drop it. The, the defence minister at the time was Linda Reynolds. She came out and said she felt sick physically sick after reading the Brereton Report. We told that to the world. Then we went out to the world and said we had betrayed the legacy of the Anzacs. We've got China and Russia questioning our human rights record. Russia, the country which poisons political opponents. At least the Liberals didn't do that. I'm Ben Harvey.